Matt Whitaker, former U.S. Acting Attorney General. This is such a great conversation about America, our future, what's going to save our republic. We have a great football player. Matt Whitaker is here. Matt. They tried to bury me. They didn't realize I was a C. It's a Damn Whitaker. Former Acting U.S. Attorney General. Under President Trump. I'm going to be an unwavering supporter of law enforcement. Welcome to Liberty and Justice with your host, Matt Whitaker. Today's episode is sponsored by Save Missouri Values Pack. Welcome to Liberty and Justice. I'm your host, Matt Whitaker. We're excited to have you joined today by Cash Patel. He's the first official repeat uh, guest we've had on Liberty and Justice. And we have a lot to talk about today, but before... I need to let you know that you can watch this show premieres Fridays at 7 p.m. on CPAC now. And then, of course, all the episodes are at Whitaker.tv or anywhere where you see podcasts. And don't forget to sign up for my newsletter that goes out Monday through Friday. So anyway, Cash, with that being said, um, let's just jump right into it. You know, uh, Joe Biden, uh, after he goes up to Rehoboth to, uh, at 11 today... <laughs> 11 a.m. Uh, for a long weekend to celebrate Juneteenth um, is then, I believe, scheduled to go to Saudi Arabia soon. I mean, how ridiculous is this situation? Well, first of all, great to be back with you, Matt, and everybody should be watching your show. I'm going to make sure I tell everyone on my Truth account to be watching this show uh, nonstop because you're the guests you've had and the lineups you've had lately are, have been second to none. It's been some tremendous conversations. It's only going to get better from yeah. here. I mean, I have some. I have some people, I can't say their names, but they've committed and it's just a matter of scheduling <laughs> and, you know, it could, we could even get the ultimate, uh, oh, I think, guest I think you're getting that. I think that's in the bag. You just got to figure out. We can't talk about that yet. <laughs> can't talk about fight club. But uh, look, I, yeah, but we can talk about fight with cash, but anyway, Saudi Arabia, yeah. Joe Biden. Uh, where do we start? So this so just so, and I think your audience probably knows this, but Joe Biden has taken more days away from the white house than president Trump did. Just so people know that, that's one of those facts that gets lost. And you travel with the president, President Trump. When he went away for the weekend to Bedminster or Mar-a-Lago, I was working the whole time because he was working the whole time. We see the pictures of Joe Biden on the beach going for a bike ride, not working, literally doing the opposite of work. And nobody is uh, informed as to what guest he has when he's on these beach bonanzas. But let's put that aside. Let's give the guy a long weekend for, I didn't even know Monday was a holiday. Somebody had to tell me we're not working. Monday. It's, it's officially a federal holiday uh, to celebrate Juneteenth. Um, and, you know, it is the reason uh, that we have this holiday is because two years after the um, Emancipation Proclamation, uh, the folks on Galveston Island in Texas found out and uh, that they were liberated. And so... Um, it's always, I think it's important to celebrate what Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. did, uh, you know, and, and acknowledge our history. Um, but at the same time, um, it just is a strange holiday. But at the same, we're going to celebrate it. And we're all going to take the day off. We're, we're going to celebrate it by talking about Saudi Arabia, apparently. So, you know, let's just quickly <laughs> remind your audience. Remember, I was, a, I was a national security advisor of the House Intelligence Committee when Jamal Khashoggi was killed. I literally got sent to Riyadh the, that week. Um, Okay, hold on. There, we, we're, we're never going to make the 25-minute schedule, but I got to jump in. So Khashoggi was killed. I think he was more than killed. Yeah. <laughs> you might want to give just a little, a couple more descriptors on that. Sorry. Former and ultimately, federal prosecutor, yeah. terrorism crimes. Donald Trump got berated for partnering with the Saudis on so many efforts, including Middle East peace, because Jamal Khashoggi, a Saudi citizen who was a journalist part-time in America, was killed in the reporting showed at the behest of MBS, the, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And then he was supposedly dismembered and all these nasty things. And the media and the American left wanted to reject all things Saudi Arabia and hated Donald Trump for even speaking to Saudi Arabia. Fast forward, I haven't heard the name Jamal Khashoggi come up once in any of the left wing media that has now announced President Biden going to Saudi Arabia. And Biden is going to Saudi Arabia out of a need of his, out of necessity because of what he created. We need oil. That doesn't cost seven bucks a gallon. 
And MBS is like, sure, why don't you come over here and basically beg for it, and I might give it to you. That's not the situation we had under President Trump. And I just think this shows you the national security shift, the dynamic shift from when President Trump was in office and how he handled foreign leaders, including MBS, versus now Joe Biden is getting a pass from the same media that excoriated Trump for talking to the likes of MBS in Saudi Arabia. So I don't see this trip as really being fruitful because the Saudis have the upper hand. They've been deflecting on Biden's calls and they've also hosted leaders from Iran and other places who we dislike during the Biden administration. So um, you have studied this region, you've been in this region a lot. Um, you know, if you remember, uh, you boil it down, George Bush felt they had to protect the American interests, which was the flow of oil mm -hmm. out of the Middle East. And so we had to engage in these, you know, Iraq war um, and, uh, you know, Afghanistan war. And those went on forever. The American people, at least my experience was American people grew tired mm -hmm. of the kind of these forever wars. And ultimately, you know, we have, you know, we, we completely left. <laughs> Afghanistan, Biden did, and you know uh, the Iraq situation is is a little more stable, but and a little more uh, uh, I, what would you say sophisticated government? I don't know. It's hard to say. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's a proxy, you know, battleground for you know the Shiites and the Sunnis. But uh, that being said, you know, is Joe Biden's visit to the Middle East just sort of a reintroduction of the United States of America and our national interests being again in the Middle East? Yeah, look, that's a great way of framing it. I think it's the ultimate example of, the, of how this administration has politicized the national security apparatus of the United States. And this is the consequence. Instead of working with our allies, we are now going to go in and beg for cheaper gas and petroleum products because it's costing us so much at home. Let's put aside the fact that Joe Biden has decided to not have America be energy independent like President Trump did with the pipelines and all the other drilling matters. But he's also, while he's out there, the mainstream media is going to give him a pass on the history related to Jamal Khashoggi and the double standard with President Trump. But he's by going just to Saudi Arabia, he's going to tick off every other member of the Middle East countries that we used to have a great relationship with. It's not like he's swinging through all of them. And he doesn't have an, a request that I've seen or heard about to them that makes a, a, a relationship on par with the Saudis as it were under Trump. And this situation just isn't going to lead to anything good for America. And you're right. It's yeah. going to re-engage us into the affairs of the Middle East, which are so complicated and President Trump so successfully explicated us from. And Iraq is just the, the you know, the, the unfortunate example of it, it's, it's a it's a no win area. <laughs> that's being run by our enemies, basically. And now Joe Biden is probably going to tick them off even more. Right, right. And I, I look at the world and, uh, you know, obviously China is a major threat. Uh, they are projecting power uh, into really South America now, uh, making friends and doing their Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. down there uh, in violation of, you know, sort of our, our, our longstanding um, control of our hemisphere. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I think with this re-engagement and begging for oil wherever we can find it, when we have all we would ever need in the United States, just shows you how radical mm -hmm. this green agenda is. And, you know, call it what it is, which it is a complete shift away from burning carbon uh, to uh, I guess call it renewables. I mean, again, the left has won the naming <laughs> war. Um, I notice that that ethanol, like from my home state of Iowa, Joe Biden does not think that's a renewable because he is against the year-round E15 um, standard uh, that you know friends in Iowa and around the Midwest would support. So it's it's only their kind of renewable. It's not <laughs> what. Rick Perry famously said an all of the above energy approach, which I think is actually the best because, you know, if you think about when we are the best as a country, it's when there's competition. It's when as individuals we get to choose based on not only affordability, but our desire. And if we want to drive a Tesla, then you drive a Tesla. There are about, you know, there's at least a car for every human being in the United States. So over 300 million cars, mm -hmm. only 1 million of those are electric cars. And so there's a big gap. These American people that are paying $7 a gallon still need 
gas for their cars currently. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, speaking of the Green New Deal and where the liberals stand on, you know, on on these issues, uh, I'll just put AOC aside for a second. I'll get back to her. But but right. you're right. The, what I think America is quietly realizing is American energy independence wasn't just a slogan under President Trump because he took the approach, as you outlined by Rick Perry, of all of the above. Solar, wind, sea, electric, petrol, nuclear. He went all in. He said, why shouldn't we be energy independent and powered by all of these things? This administration, fast forward, takes their national security cues and direction from the media, unfortunately. And the media has been screaming about the Green New Deal since Joe Biden was running for office or since he got into office, led by the likes of AOC. And I'm just wondering why I haven't heard her screaming that Joe Biden, the Green New Deal guy, is going to Saudi Arabia to buy oil at a steep premium so America can somewhat get through the summer without paying $150 a pump um, every time we go to the gas station. I mean, the, the hypocrisy is kind of what ticks me off more than anything, except for the lack of accountability. But this trip should show the world. And of course, he's not just going to he's he's saying he's going to go to like London and somewhere else, you know, so he can say he went on a multi, uh, you know, country right. swing. But everyone knows the sole purpose of this trip is to kiss the ring of the Saudis. So we might get a breather back at home. So he can say, then go say, look, America, I saved us from the oil crisis. But like you said astutely, you just entrenched us back into the Middle East. Right. And I'm worried the Saudis are not um, unsophisticated. No. <laughs> they get it. I mean, they are, you know, they are ruthless. They understand their national interests. I fear that they are going to embarrass the United States through our president uh, by, you know, you said making him kiss the ring, you know, doing even more than that. Uh, and, and, and I just don't think that our national security apparatus or our diplomatic apparatus under Joe Biden can handle it. They, I just don't think they can stagecraft this to make it look like anything uh, that they want it to look like. I think it is clearly a genuflection of the United States to the Saudis. And, you know, I just I, I go back to what I said and, you know, you reiterate it, but it's just so important. I just feel like we're. You know, we're 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 going back to the past of, you know, Middle East oil interests um, that I really thought Trump had transitions out of. But this is, you know, again, people say elections have consequences. And this is one of the things I mean, maybe you got rid of the the mean tweets, but we certainly paid a very high price for that. We're paying an enormous price. And I want this moment to like mark in history the time that you uh, surmise that the Democrats have put us back into the Middle East. Not Trump, yeah. it's the Democrats. We did not have this scenario under President Trump, and now Joe Biden is leading this effort. And we're going to have to pick a side, by the way. Everyone knows the Middle East doesn't get along with everybody. The Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris, the Bahrainis, all these folks aren't singing kumbaya over there. They're in competition with one another. But more importantly now, they have actually unified to to be in competition instead of in concert with the United States of America. And that, I think, for me, is the biggest loss we see on the diplomatic stage. Uh, that's the difference now with President Biden going over there selectively yeah. to get a political win rather than bringing that coalition and the GCC countries together like we were under Trump to have not just peace in the Middle East. You know, we say that casually, but that was a monumental achievement. But to have our allies in the Middle East not align with our enemies. Don't get in bed right. with Iran, the number one state sponsor of terror. These countries that I just named have hosted Iranian leadership in their countries for the first time in years because they know America can't counteract that with the diplomatic uh, leadership we have. And his cabinet is just not poised to do anything to counterman these efforts. And uh, it's only going to lead to a decrease in our national security, I think, unfortunately. Yeah, and why not before you go to Saudi Arabia or, you know, God forbid he goes to Venezuela or somewhere else. <laughs> Why not go to Texas? Why not go to New Mexico? Yeah. Why not go to North Dakota and encourage the exploration, development and drilling and pumping of American oil? It's just and, you know, re-implement at Keystone uh, Pipeline and do all the kind of things that um, that, that should be done uh, to to ensure American energy independence. Uh, but, you know, they're just so unwilling to do that. And it's going to put us in a bad place. And, you know, mark my word, and you know this probably better than most, 
And but I think our listeners need to understand, you know, with the Russian uh, oil ban, at least, you know, not in the European Union necessarily, but but uh, for the United States and then Iran on, you know, sanctions, um, who's going to launder that oil and get it on the world market? It's going to be the Saudis or it's going to be one of those other groups. Am I am I wrong? I mean, that's exactly what you're gonna totally happen. right They're They are going to they are on the verge of making so much money, which is why they are MBS and company over there in, in, in Saudi Arabia is laughing while receiving our commander in chief because they're just seeing their bank accounts explode. And it's a direct result of decisions like Joe Biden allowing Nord Stream 2 to be completed. The giant gas and energy pipeline that the Russians built into Germany, which President Biden stopped, excuse me, President Trump stopped and President Biden allowed, that on top of the actual oil, the global oil crisis that he has, he Biden has created with policies like uh, Nord Stream 2, have catapulted the Saudi oil production. They don't need any of the other Middle Eastern countries anymore. OPEC is a thing of the past. That used to be a scenario where you had to get the Middle Eastern countries to play nice because you wanted to somewhat control oil capacity and production. The Saudi, we just, Joe Biden just gave the Saudis a, a, a hall pass to say basically do whatever you want. It's so bad in America, just give me a win in the short term. And that's politics, that's not national security. Yeah, and then you know, I mean, he's, I, I hate to say this, but the presidents, you know, the vice presidents use the word malaise, the presidents using the word recession. Um, you know, we had a 75 basis point increase in the Fed yeah. funds rate, the market just seized up, at least the stock market seizing up. I mean, this, uh, they couldn't try to screw this up more than they have. I, I can't think of one move that they've made that has made any American's life better. You know, we got rising crime in our major cities. No, June, Juneteenth. Just, Juneteenth. We have off Juneteenth, so you and I get that. You're right. We have Monday off, so the federal uh, employees get another uh, holiday <laughs> to not work. Um, it's it's extraordinary cash. I, I, I you know, I hope uh, and pray that we're finally seeing a decoupling of the kind of ordinary Americans, working Americans, and these big city elites like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and you know, you mentioned AOC, but these people that are so detached from the real experience of of our fellow citizens that they 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 are incapable of leading because they are they 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 worship at the altar of wokeism, yeah. and you know they you know Nancy Pelosi has been banned from communion from her own church uh, because of her radical beliefs. I mean, it's just extraordinary, and you know, and and you know, we're sitting here. Um, on Friday, you know, the day that the show premieres, uh, waiting for the Dobbs opinion. And I fully expect that we are going to have another round of political violence. Mm -hmm. Guarantee it, Congress isn't going to have hearings like they are on January 6th, but you're going to have more chaos and mayhem and, and more injured police officers and, and more of what we saw in the summer of 2020. It's extraordinary. Well, that, that's what I call, you know, uh, leadership by hypocrisy. And, you know, whether you're talking about Second Amendment or the Supreme Court decisions that are pending or the January 6th committee, it's all the same, in my opinion, in terms of leadership by hypocrisy. They want to take away your guns, but it's OK for Nancy Pelosi and AOC to have armed personnel guards carrying the guns they want to ban from you just so they can live in their gated communities. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer want to encourage and incite violence against our Supreme Court justices when it politically favors them but then not even talk about it when there was an assassination attempt on a sitting Supreme Court justice. Um, that should just shudder everyone into seeing what the truth actually is, but unfortunately it doesn't. And if that weren't enough, the Democrats have Hollywoodized the January 6th proceedings. And I've always been in all favor of a bipartisan, an actual bipartisan commission that seeks to figure out what happened on January 6th so it doesn't happen again. I've always been in favor of that. But they bring in an ABC News executive. Oh, by the way, this guy was the same guy that spiked the stories of Jeffrey Epstein's victims while he was at ABC News. Where is the Me Too movement on this January 6th procession? And if it weren't bad enough in the media, now this committee itself has taken a day pause because there's so much intra fighting going on. And I think one of the outlets that carries the, the show um, decided to show the U.S. Open in golf last night instead of these hearings because they've totally lost. It was more. The golf was more. It interesting. is. I mean, I'm biased. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be watching it all weekend. I, but 
you know, my, 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 my position is that the media allows this leadership by hypocrisy and then the American people, unfortunately, don't get to see anything else. And they're like, oh, this must be true. And, you know, you're right. I'm afraid once these, I'm not afraid of the decisions at the Supreme Court. I'm afraid of what people are going to do and think they are permitted to do as a result of those decisions. And you as a former attorney general know above all, what happened to law enforcement in this country? When did it become political? I, I don't know. And, and I worry that, you know, they're, they're, in a, they're in a no-win situation now because, you know, so much of what the left is doing is blaming the police. Mm-hmm. And so you do your job, you get accused of, you know, overreach or, or brutality or whatever else. And if you don't do your job, then the world melts down. And it's, you know, the District of Columbia especially has, I think, a real challenge because the political um, you know, leaders just are not pro cop and the cops know that. And so they're, they're not, you know, it's a little bit of the Ferguson effect where they're just going to retreat, uh, into their squad cars and kind of, you know, sort of watch it go down because they know even if they bring these mm-hmm. cases, these prosecutors aren't going to take them. No, you're right. You know, we, we, have this, we have this explosion of gun crimes yet in New York city, the prosecutors rejecting 80% of all the gun crimes that are referred for prosecution. I mean, how that's, if you're a cop doing your job and, uh, eight out of every 10 or four out of every five gun criminals are prosecuted. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that, that pretty soon you're not going to want to do your job. That, that was unheard uh, of when you and I were federal prosecutors, when we brought these crimes, when we brought serious criminal cases, 99% of them were not only accepted, but resulted in convictions and rightfully so, because we wanted fewer crime in our streets. You know, the one positive, I, I, I guess I will share about the whole, you know, cert and it's no question that the, the crime rates have t- tripled or quadrupled in major U.S. cities is that you're starting to see somewhat of a boomerang effect where these district attorneys out west are actually being recalled in places of of, of the epicenter of the woke, you know, uh, movement. And to me, if we can get one or two more of those uh, recalls to go the right way, I think America is going to see, well, okay, we actually got this one way wrong. And we need to have more district attorneys recalled, like in DC, like in New York. And, you know, New York's my hometown and I read the New York Post every day. And I saw uh, an article the other day saying maybe the the D.A. Bragg, the guy up there, he'll be recalled, which is something that's unheard of in New York City. But I think that's what we have to drive towards. We have to we can't just tell people across America who disagree with us politically that uh, our way in law enforcement is the right way. You have to show them. And you show them by saying, look, cities like Portland and company are recalling mayors. L.A. has a recall now for their uh, district attorney. They're going to have 800,000 signatures on that recall petition. Yeah. Well, well, maybe we'll call our buddy Rick Rennell. He's got California dialed up. (laughs) He's he's, he's fixing it. Um, It's going to be a a long-term project. Um, So back to the January 6th, I want want some more color from you on January 6th. But before you say that, and this is, you know, not going to the substance of January 6th, uh, but I agree with your point that this, you know, if there was a true bipartisan committee that was looking into, you know, the the intelligence failures, uh, you know, sort of the the strategic decisions that were made and who made them, you know, the whether or not to bring the National Guard, as you've talked a lot about, um, recently, you know, that would be one thing. And if you had cross-examination of witnesses, <laughs> both sides for witnesses and a fair hearing, but no, this is a one-sided, you know, just complete kangaroo court. But the thing that's frustrating me the most, and you know, you've been in front of Congress, I've been in front of Congress, is the teleprompter. I mean, these people that are asking questions off of a teleprompter and you see where now, I like to, when I tuned in, I think it was yesterday, they had one the councils asking questions because I think they were just kind of tired of these Congress members of Congress being unable to actually follow a <laughs> examination of a witness. It was I just the whole thing is it just makes me shake my head and think what you know what are we watching here other than just a political commercial? No, and that's it. What we're watching is the politicization and why people hate Congress. So look, I'll highlight the 9/11 Commission. You know the standard in what a bipartisan congressional investigation should look like. I will keep my bias and our success in the Russiagate investigation out of this conversation. But um, the 9-11 Commission concluded that, um, many things, but intelligence was being stovepiped and that was partly the cause for the failure to detect 9-11. The same thing is happening in the January 6th proceedings. We have now found out that the FBI and other intelligence agencies had information that they didn't share fully 
uh, with other agencies. And I think John Solomon just broke the story last week. They selectively shared it ahead of time with Chuck Schumer's staff, but not with me, the chief of staff of the Department of Defense. These fixes were supposed to have been addressed as a result of the 9-11 commission. Um, And you see the failure of this commission to style itself based on facts. As you were saying, you can't cross-examine a witness from a teleprompter. You can read a commercial in a Hollywood story from a teleprompter. And, you know, I think the narrative they want to advance is that President Trump was somehow implementing a coup. And and the thing I say to people on that is, look, as the chief of staff at DOD, um, how is it that the commander in chief ordered us to transition to the Biden presidency and was going to utilize the military to perform a coup. I asked these people the facts about those facts on January 6th and they were they were speechless, of course, and they didn't, they didn't yeah, care. So, you know, the narrative is uh, drowning the facts, unfortunately, but um, you got to stop watching. You're, you were their one watcher last night, Matt. You don't do it again. I wasn't watching last night. It was during the day. I was I had better things to do last night, like almost uh, lose 15 pounds in because uh, it was so hot and humid in St. Louis. But um, so in the few minutes we have left, um, you know, I know that you uh, continue to, uh, you know, we were out together in Nevada helping Adam Laxalt. Um, he won by 22 points. Yeah. I was, you know, um, very happy to see he'll be, a, you know, he's, that's going to be a great matchup. Uh, you know, the, the, the map is narrowing. You know, we have about five states mm-hmm. now where the Senate is going to be decided. I think the House, you know, because of the design of the House, you know, we probably will pick up some enough seats to take the mm-hmm. majority. Uh, the Senate's money, it's, it's, it's the bad year cycle for us. You know, there's three, you know, sort of every two years, mm-hmm. a third of the Senate turns over. And it's, it's a bad map as the maps go for us this time. And it's going to be it's going to be a tough map. I mean, you've you've gotten around the country. What do you uh, you know, we have Oz as our nominee. We have uh, Herschel Walker as our nominee in Georgia. Uh, we now have Adam in uh, Nevada. And I think the only other two seats that I can think of are Missouri and Arizona, where we um, where we have, you know, kind of what are going to be very competitive couple. One we need to hold and one we need to take uh, to take the advantage. Yeah, look, if like I agree with you fully. I think we'll pick up probably 40 seats in the House and we only need five to get the majority. And with that 40, you get closer to that super majority, which allows you to operate more fully. And I'm going to remind the folks in Congress that I used to work with when I ran Russiagate, we're now going to be in leadership positions again, that remember what they did to us. And I'm not saying we have to exact vengeance tick for tot, but you have to exclude members like Adam Schiff from having any leadership position and the swallows of the world because they are wrecking democracy. They are not upholding it. And I think that needs to happen with some serious investigations in the House at the Judicial Committee, at the Intelligence Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I'm going to be speaking about that to the members of Congress that I've worked with on Russiagate and remind them that that's why they're there. On the Senate side, if we just even win, I think, four of the six races you talked about, we'll get to 53 in the Senate, which is as you highlighted, in a year that we're not supposed to gain seats, if we net pick up four, that is huge. And I firmly believe Adam Laxalt is going to win out in Nevada. You know, we have two great candidates, Herschel Walker with the support of the president in Georgia and Oz in Pennsylvania. We've got more than a shot there. And if we can get our act together in Arizona and Missouri, um, you know, that's one of the biggest things. And you and I talk about it, you know, like we need to coalesce around candidates that have a chance at actually winning. And sometimes that means giving up what your strident beliefs are for the overall good, because we've seen what not being in the majority allows the Democrats to do. And we just can't afford to do that um, in the next election cycle. So, you know, I think it's going our way. And, um, uh, you know, if your if your audience gets bored and wants to read a children's book, go read the plot against the king. But other than that, well, I was yeah, I was going to get to that. I mean, we're we're kind of running out of time, and and the listeners to this show are always telling me, uh, mostly through what they're paying attention to in the in the episodes that I've already released, is they want more cash. <laughs> now, Joe Biden's America, I think that also means they need more cash <laughs> in their bank account, but they certainly want more cash, Patel, as well. Um, 
Cash, how do people find out what you're doing? Uh, where's the best place to yeah, find Yeah, just a couple places. So Truth Social is the only social media platform I'm on at Cash. You can always find me at my foundation, fightwithcash.com. Our fight to help fund people who need lawyers. We've expanded it to a 501c3. We're now helping pay, raise money for kids for tuition, for summer camps, for educational platforms over at fightwithcash.com. And then, you know, if you really want to help me educate our children on the truth, go buy a copy of The Plot Against the King at theplotagainstthekeng.com. It's Russiagate for kids. Um, who could have more fun uh, than us with yeah. the truth? And, you know, in all seriousness, my, my universe revolves around just driving towards the mission of the truth. It doesn't matter what the result yeah. is if you stay on that path and our kids should be on that path. Um, and so uh, check us out. But if they're not following you on Truth Social and me, I'm going to have we're going to have some serious problems. Yeah, they should be following us both. And uh I think you are going to be a regular occurrence on this show. You are so popular and you're also uh, so wise in, uh, in your perspective. And I, I just think, you know, this, the, the show has, I think we've really discussed some, some key issues that are facing our country, especially the Saudi Arabia trip and, yeah. and, and the, the, you know, reintroduction of the Middle East as an issue for the United States of America. So uh, thank you for everyone for listening and watching Liberty and Justice. I'm your host, Matt Whitaker. Thank you to my guest. Cash Patel. Um, we will see you next time. Remember everything I'm doing at Whitaker.tv and make sure you sign up for our newsletter. Till next time.